Hello, BookTube. Are you ready for a little more of the team-up you didn't know you needed? <laughs> Let me explain. <laughs> a little while ago, Grammaticus Books, terrific BookTube channel, I'll leave a link to his, uh, to his channel down below, uh, he did a video on the top five, on five of the, his favorite science fiction movies adapted from written source material, short stories, novels, that sort of thing. Uh, and that was part one of two, so he had ten movies in mind with a few honorable mentions. And I saw the first movie, uh, and I, I the first video of his, and then I saw the second video of his, and I felt the need uh, to step in and gently correct him <laughs> where he makes mistakes, where he goes astray, uh, and to suggest the correct list, which of course is my own. <laughs> and in the course of the exchange about those raucous videos between, let's face it, Booktube's two alpha dude bros, the idea came up that maybe we would make a list, dueling list, of the top ten science fiction movies that were not adapted from books or science fiction or written material at all. He agreed in his youthful bravado, <laughs> and so here we are. He has made his video of the top ten science fiction movies not adapted from books. I'll leave a link to it down below. And I am giving a response. Even though we run a severe risk by doing these videos. It's the risk I mentioned last time. It's the risk that the videos will be swarmed by the very worst people in the world. <laughs> by film buffs. Specifically by film buffs who are, who are inflicted with the triple T's. Truffaut, Tarkovsky, and Tarantino. That we run the risk in making these videos that our comments feel is going to be full of uh, the unbelievable glacier high condescension that only film buffs can do. Only film bros can can bring that to the table in only one chin stroking line of, on a comments field. We run that risk. And it's not a congenial risk because although Grammaticus and I are different in a lot of ways, one way that I think we share in common is that we not only can't stand condescension in other people, but we never are ourselves condescending. Nevertheless, we're going to run the risk. So he made his video, and I have to confess, before I, I, I the first confession is that I forgot that the videos were due today, uh, but the second confession is before I watched his video, I was, uh, as the kids say, getting the popcorn ready. I was assuming that I would be able to pounce all over his choices, much as I did his, his last two lists. But I predicted two things about his list. One, is that almost all the movies would be set in the 1980s. And two, that a lot of them would be unrewatchable. Which, I don't see what's controversial about saying that, uh, that if a movie isn't rewatchable, it's not good. <laughs> I don't see the controversy in that. Fritz Lang's Metropolis is not rewatchable. <laughs> it's not even, I would argue, watchable, <laughs> much less rewatchable. I, I wondered... I wondered which of those two things would be true and how much I could pounce on that. Now, I was right about one thing about his list. Technically, I think only half of his list is in the 1980s, but two-thirds of the other five are in are close enough so it doesn't matter. The late 1990s, seven out of his ten, are basically in the long 1980s. <laughs> if we go by the height of the hair, then seven out of his ten are in the 1980s. So I was right about that. But uh, the rest... Well, we're going to see, because I'm going to go through his list before I give you the correct list. <laughs> and I want to go through the rules that he came up with first. He, he sent me an email and said, I, I've got some rules. And my, before I read the email, my first thought was, oh, no, I don't like rules, typically. I especially don't like rules that fence in events. But all of his rules, I would have made myself. They were all ident They are perfect, absolutely perfect. The thing has to have had a public, a, a, a common release. It can't be some art house piece of crap that, well, let's be honest, neither Grammaticus nor I would ever mention such a thing. But a lot of you, if you're a film buff, it'll be the only thing you'll think about. Uh, it can't be something like that. It has to have had a theatrical release. It can't be anime. Good God. I don't keep up with all of the the anime movies that are out there with their epicene characters and their their weird spiritual revelations at the end it can't be anime it also can't be superhero universes technically speaking the sprawling superheroes that are movies that have dominated the theaters for the last 15 years technically they are science fiction 
but it can't be any one of those. Even the darling of a list like this, which I'm sure would be the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie, it can't be any of those. Uh, I gladly agreed to those rules, and uh, observing those rules, Grammaticus Works came up with his top ten list. Uh, he starts off, you'll never guess, in the 1980s. <laughs> he starts off in 1984 with James Cameron's Terminator. With, with Schwarzenegger, and, and I can just... When I'm looking at his list, I can just picture the younger Grammaticus going to these movies. <laughs> and Terminator is very good. Uh, it's a... It's a... It was my first Harbinger on his list that I was going to be disappointed in my desire to pounce and rend and flay and tear <laughs> because he doesn't have any bad movies on his list. Not really. Uh, the Terminator being on his list and starting it off raises a it raises a fun conversation really rather than anything rather than a disagreement because typically it is thought in uh, in, in the non film bro view of movies it's typically thought that when it comes to science fiction franchises two is greater than one <laughs> the second is almost always better than the first his second choice for instance on his list is star trek the wrath of khan by nicholas meyer uh it's uh it's from 1982, <laughs> so, but but it is widely regarded as almost inaugurating the tradition where the second movie in a in a science fiction big screen show will be better than the first one. Star Trek II, Superman II, the list goes on and on. You're going to see a couple of them on my list. I think that is largely right, uh, but I'm I was I I didn't put any Star Trek on my list. Or any Star Wars on my list, because somehow or other, when we said no comic book movies, I kind of thought that meant no franchise movies. I don't think, honestly, that I would put any of I don't think I'm, that you're missing out. I don't think I would put anything from either franchise on my list. Star Trek II is, of course, fantastic. Grammaticus Books calls it the greatest Star Trek movie ever made. Okay. I probably agree with that. I, I, I will always have a, a bottomless sentimental spot in my heart for Star Trek Three, but I would probably agree with that for a couple of reasons. One will be one will be obvious one is obvious if you've ever seen the show, it's a terrific movie. And the other will be obvious at the very end of my list. <laughs> but then uh for his third pick, number eight, he picks The Matrix, nineteen ninety-nine, uh directed by the Wachowski brothers. And Again, there's no pouncing, there's no rending, there's no tearing. The Matrix is a terrific movie. Absolutely terrific movie. Uh, I always mention that that I, I, I always love it when a movie has a terrific bit. I, like, I love it when the movie as a whole is really good. But I love it when the movie has a terrific bit in it. Star Trek II has two of those, <laughs> in my opinion. Unless you count the entire Battle of the Mutara Nebula as a bit. Then it would have three. <laughs> it has the single greatest moment that characterizes the character of Jim, of James T. Kirk in any movie or any TV show. A perfect Kirk moment. And it also has the famous ending. The ending of the movie is not a dry eye in the house. So it has a, it has a great bit. And for me, uh, The Matrix also has a couple of great bits. The, the What I can only imagine is the enormously expensive exposition scene that shows us how the world got the way it is in the movie is amazing just amazing and of course my favorite bit in the whole movie is neo's resurrection in the subway tunnel at the, at the end of the movie that scene never i never tire of that scene at all i love it then his number seven is dark city uh which is alex proyas it's 1998 uh rufus sewell movie he gives you a, a, a just a brief mention that you're probably not going to know rufus sewell unless by sight because he has a very distinctive cast to his eye uh i always think that's a shame i think he's tremendously talented i just i don't know that we're ever gonna i don't know if he's ever gonna get the the vehicle that actually makes it so that that is obvious to everybody every i've been, i've never seen him do a bad job in anything that he's ever done and he's all over the place he gets tons of work but uh i, I i'm not all I'm not all that big a fan of dark city it's probably the weakest one on this list for me but it's still good it's still good, so I don't know what to do about that. And then his number six is Predator. We're back to the 1980s. We're in 1987. This is John McTiernan of Die Hard fame. And also, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the 13th Warrior fame. 13th Warrior, I think, is his best movie. And just an amazing movie. And, again, 
okay. <laughs> Predator is is it's an action popcorn movie. It's it's really really good. Uh it it had sequels, <laughs> but uh, but I can understand what it's doing on this list. Then for number five, Grammaticus picks Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which is 1977. But come on, it's a 1980s movie. I'm sure he saw it in the 1980s. And this is Steven Spielberg, and he mentions in his video uh, that he wanted to put a Spielberg on this list, but that he'd be he'd be hanged, drawn, and quartered if it was going to be E.T. And my heart just swelled three sizes that day because I feel, of course, the same way about E.T. It is revolting. <laughs> it's an absolutely revolting movie. But uh, Close Encounters might be, for me, even weaker than Dark City. It is, because again, I am talking about rewatchable. I'm talking about something that you want to put in and watch. Not that you think you need to do annual or every five years religious observation but something that you want to put in and watch and that you won't fast forward through the, the people watching it with you won't fall asleep or leave the room and text in another room. And I don't think close encounters climbs that bar. I really don't. It's a, it's a ponderous movie. It's a rare, a rare, I think as far as pacing goes, a rare failure for Spielberg, although venerated. So, uh, then for his, for his number four, he picks, uh, we're back in the 1980s. This is 1989. And this is a, the abyss by James Cameron, which is a heck of a movie, a heck of a movie. I don't know if maybe the reason it didn't make anywhere near my list is because of the very thing that a lot of people who really appreciate this movie really like, which is the ending. The, there's a whole movie here that that is about well it's it's about the the possibility that did you ever actually imagine that there was something down there in the depths of the ocean and you were probably wrong about that and people think you're wrong about that maybe you think you're wrong about that maybe there's nothing down there so nine tenths of the movie is a story is a very human drama between the crew of one vessel and a, a marine who is slowly going insane with the bends, and it's wonderfully done. It also has, it also has a couple of killer bits, absolutely killer bits. One of which is harrowing even now. After all this time, a character has to make a decision to drown, make a, a conscious decision to drown, and it. <laughs> I remember seeing that in the theater and thinking. I just, I was stunned by that. And then there's a very predictable bit. A character throughout the movie has been, has been boasting about how he has such an incredible single powerful punch that people have uh, developed a folklore about his fist. And at the very climax of the movie, we think that maybe he's all bluster because it looks like he's afraid to take a chance. And then he gets his great moment at the end of the movie, and oh my, I could that moment, that moment I could watch forever and ever. It is a really, really good movie. Uh, the, it has all sorts of scenes. Most of the memorable scenes, the stuff that you'll remember, is not science fiction. I firmly believe that the last half hour of the movie will not be the stuff you remember. Whereas, whereas, uh, Ed Harris infuriated over the woman that he loves but also hates, the woman that he married but can't stand rips his wedding ring off and throws it in the ship's toilet and then goes fishing for it because he because that stuff like that little things like that i believe that cameron almost completely lost his ability to even think about scenes like that but he did that really well uh then we come to number three chromatic spokes number three is the empire strikes back i'll never guess what but it's in the 1980s it's 1980 and this is urban kersher and it's the sequel. It's a sequel to Star Wars, of course. And uh, I have a feeling that, that Grammaticus Books was a Star Wars baby. I have a feeling that uh, we're probably talking in the area of uh, Star Wars bedsheets. <laughs> Perhaps a plastic lightsaber. I'd be, if I had to guess, I would probably say that that's true. And you can always tell when that's true because the person who's mentioning Empire Strikes Back will make all sorts of unsupportable claims for it, and he does. But it's so charming, and it is a very, very good movie, so I can't really object. Then his number two is uh, 1979, but come on. <laughs> it's 1980, and it's Alien by Ridley Scott. The Nostromo, out in space, uh, being ordered to, uh, investigating a signal that is not random, and finding something horrifying, something uh, that it, the like of which had not been seen in science fiction movies. And Alien is really effective. I myself can't get over 
uh, the, the shabby look of it all. It doesn't, I know that that's very shallow, you, you, but I like my science fiction to look like science fiction. And I, it, 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 Alien doesn't. It, our crew looks like they're in some sort of diner in Arkansas. <laughs> or whatever. But it is very effective. It is very effective. And then Grammaticus Books, for his number one, surprised me enormously. Because he goes all the way forward to 2023. I would have guessed that he isn't aware that the movies are even still being made. <laughs> and, but he picks a 2023 release, Godzilla Minus One. Takashi Yamagashi. His Godzilla movie, his great Godzilla movie. I, I don't know where Grammaticus Books heard about this movie, but any of you who've been watching my channel will have heard me praising it months before it was in theaters. I've, I said on many, many a video, people or a live stream, people ask me, you know, what are you watching lately? And I would say, I have a whole bunch of screeners, but I can't, I keep watching Godzilla Minus One over and over and over again, because it's that good. Uh, I, I didn't put it on my list. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. In fact, I agree with his analysis of it. Even his analysis of its, of the two flaws that he mentions, I agree completely about all of it. I didn't put it on my list because I guess I don't trust myself to put a 2023 release on a best all-time list. I mean, what about the fourth axis? What about time? I don't know what I'll think of it. It was it was the best movie I saw in 2023. That wasn't much of a, of a crowded contest. What will I feel like in, you know, 2033? Uh, Gra Grammaticus Books will be long dead by then, but I'll still be here. <laughs> so what will we think about it in 2033? I have no idea. Uh, so I didn't put it on my list, but you were probably wondering about my list. Uh, I wondered when I started this out. Uh, before I watched this video, I thought, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to watch. How many of your picks are going to overlap with mine? In your, if you're doing a top 10 science fiction movies, surely one or two of your picks will overlap with mine. We will pick the same movie. Maybe at different places, but the same movie. And believe it or not, that did not happen. I have 10 completely different movies to, to recommend. My number 10 is Roland Emmerich. It's 1996. It's Independence Day. <laughs> the movie about an alien invasion of Earth. That is wonderful. <laughs> Talk about rewatchable. You uh, you could rewatch this thing a million times, an absolute million times. And you know, I say, I talk about how movies, science fiction movies, always have great bits in them. Uh, and Independence Day has a couple of great bits, but the best bit in the movie, unfortunately, is by Randy Quaid, who is has gone on to become a far right and actually felonious lunatic. It's <laughs> just someone. You'd be crazy to even have him in the parking lot of your movie studio, much less to have him in a movie. Uh, he's uninsurable. He's unhinged. He's violent. He's deranged. Uh, but he has the best bit in Independence Day, unfortunately. But what a movie. Then for my number nine, I will go to 2008. Matt Reeves is the director. And this is also infinitely rewatchable, but it's not it's not the same kind of viewing experience as, uh, as Independence Day. It's Cloverfield. And Cloverfield is also an, inva an alien invasion movie, but out of a very different kind. It's a very, it's entirely biological instead of technological. It's no, it's uh, not spaceships. It's, it's monsters. It's alien monsters. And it's, uh, it's one of those found footage movies. So it's all, you're seeing it through the, the recording and eye devices of everyone involved rather than an actual, you know, cinematography crane. And I ordinarily hate that. I, I ordinarily just can't stand that stuff. It's so incredibly egotistical. It just is, but in its DNA. That's why it, it, it is what it is, because it's so egotistical. But I couldn't put some other movies on my list if I was totally against directorial egotism. <laughs> now could I? And Cloverfield, I think, is just wonderful. It's incredibly creepy. But I love it. I just love it. Uh, then for my number eight, we will go to 1997. This is Luc Besson, because, you know, I love me, my French directors, and this is The Fifth Element. Which, I don't know, I haven't spoken to Grammaticus books about this, but I'd be willing to bet he loves this movie. I've never met anyone that watched it that didn't love it. It's Bruce Willis. Uh, but there are a lot of other people involved as well. There are a lot of, a lot of people that you would think would be surprising. Ian Holm is in this movie. Uh, Gary Oldman is in this movie. Uh, Luke Perry is in this movie. <laughs> There's a lot of people that you wouldn't expect. But uh, I love it. I just love it. Talk about rewatchable. I think it's it's just bursting with science fiction ideas, and uh, and yet it's got some heart to it. And then uh, for my number seven, we're going to go back a ways to 1972. 
this is this was Douglas Trumbull's, I believe, his first movie. I think it's the first movie he ever directed, and it's Silent Running. A uh, very old science fiction movie, very graceful, very well done. Uh, one pilot and a couple of robots, far, far away from Earth. And there are stakes, and there are things that happen in the movie, and it is a little, it's a lot slower than anything else that I'm recommending, but it has a hypnotic beauty to it. Uh, so I want to, I want to include something from, from a little bit earlier than the 1980s. Then for my number six, we go to the 1980s. Of course, I want to have James Cameron on my list as well. I'm going to pick Aliens, not Alien, but Ridley Scott, but Aliens, the sequel to Alien. Which I would maintain, I know that Art House Bros won't, won't agree with this, but I would maintain that Aliens is yet another perfect example of two being greater than one. I, of yet another example of a science fiction sequel that is better than the original. Whether it's Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, or Superman II, or in this case, the return of the character Ripley. The return of Sigourney Weaver as, or Weaver as Ripley. A return to the Aliens world that I think is just... I think it's so much more enjoyable. I mean, I, and, and you know, I don't have any proof of this, but I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that in the Grammaticus home, <laughs> if he had a choice, if he was, I've had a long day, uh, I'm, I'm, having such poor taste in movies is exhausting. <laughs> so I, I want to throw a movie up on the screen and just enjoy myself. He'll put on Aliens, not Alien. I firmly believe that. I don't know of anybody who wouldn't make that choice. So that's my number four. My number five is yet another example of two being greater than one, and that is Predators. <laughs> Predator 2 from 1990. This is Jim and John Thomas, and it's the sequel to Predator. And it's a sloppier movie uh, than Predator, certainly. It's, it's less technically done, certainly less well-directed. You don't get much better than John Tiernan. Uh... But I love it so much more. It is, certainly leans a lot more into the science fiction. In the first Predator movie, the science fiction is the Predator. This thing at the end, this commando group, thinks they know what they're up against. And it takes the whole movie for them to realize they're not. That they're, what they're up against is something literally not of this world. Whereas in Predator 2, that's known a lot earlier and shown a lot more. And I love it. Especially, there, well, <laughs> there's one particular scene that I'm really fond of, but I also love the ending. The ending is terrific. I, 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 I wish that either Danny Glover had not been cast in the movie or he had been told to care a little bit more than he does. But uh, I'll take it. I'll take what I get. Uh, then, uh, where are we up to here? Uh, number four. Number four is Danny Boyle. This is from 2007. It's a movie called Sunshine. Uh, that has uh, well, has a whole cast of characters, actors that you'll know. It's about a ship that has a mission uh, to affect the sun, Earth's sun, in order to bring... Is that because I recommended Predator 2 over Predator? <laughs> Aliens over Alien? Uh it, this this ship that with these people on it ha is is going as really close to the sun. They're going to the sun in order to realign the I forget the science fiction mumbo jumbo in this in the movie. But the the problem is the sun is not going to shine on Earth anymore unless they succeed. Uh, so they have that mission, and the the bulk of the beginning of the movie is life on board that ship, and also the weird science at the beginning of the movie, which is something that we forget, humans forget, uh, which is just how big and horrifying the sun is. We, it's it's 93 million miles away, and yet it can burn your skin. So, so we, we tend to forget that. In this movie, this ship is going to the sun. There's a scene at the beginning of the movie where the captain of the vessel decides to decrease the dimming on his solar screens by just a couple of percentage points, and it overwhelms. It's, it's, it's the, whole, the whole visual world. It's not just the horizon. The whole visual world is this wall of superheated plasma. Uh, and I think it really works. I think it has wonderful, wonderful moments in it. There's a, the, there's a character played by Chris Evans. His death scene is not something you'll see coming, and it's weird. 
it's weird and it works. A lot of this movie works. The one thing that doesn't work, the one thing I should prepare you for if you've never seen it, is the ending. There's a, a Grammaticus books in his video about Godzilla minus one. He mentions that uh, that the ending was a little too Hollywood. And the amazing thing is we all know what's meant by that, and it's not good. We all know what somebody means when they say, "Oh, that was a Hollywood thing to do." And sunlight is remark sunshine is remarkably free of Hollywood until the very end. And then the in the end you get you get Hollywood. <laughs> but but uh, <sighs> the rest of it I strongly recommend as science fiction. Uh, then we'll go to number three. This is 2004. This is Zack Snyder. Again, I think this might be his first movie. Uh, but this is Dawn of the Dead, which I mentioned on this channel many, many times before. Not the dumb, boring Dawn of the Dead that all the film bros claim to like but never watch, but rather the real Dawn of the Dead with Ving Rhames. Still a zombie apocalypse, still a zombie outbreak, but oh my, talk about rewatchable. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Right from the beginning, from the opening scene, right at the beginning... When you've got this this pleasant little neighborhood full of picturesque cul-de-sacs. And yet, that little girl isn't a little girl anymore. And the next time you step outside, it's all gone to hell. And that's not even the actual beginning. The actual beginning for the credits is astonishing. As, as a work just of art on its own, it's astonishing. But then you get that opening sequence where our female main character manages to survive her own neighborhood. Barely. And the movie just keeps going from there. It was one great scene after another. It's got tons and tons of subversive humor. It's got great dialogue, a whole spectrum of different kinds of characters, all of whom are given depth. Even the dumb bad guy is given depth by the end of the movie. And the end of the movie, oh, the final, the final scene of the movie. Oh, just, it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. If you think all zombie movies blend together, watch this one. If you've never seen it. Watch this one. Uh, then my number two is uh, a little bit off the beaten path here. It's a ghost story. It's 2017. It's David Lowry directing it. Uh, Casey Affleck is in it. And that's all it is, the story of a ghost. A guy dies, and he comes back to watch the world that he's just left. And he is, it's, it's very stereotypically not lavishing you with special effects. He's just got a sheet on. <laughs> he's got a sheet with holes. Uh, and I, I, when I started watching it, I thought, all right, well, this is going to be your hipster doofus utterly cynical take on ghosts and horror movies but no no it, it's full of heart i loved it absolutely loved it and the ending talk about the ending that that the ending here the, the, there's a climactic scene sequence you'll if you know the movie you'll know what i mean it's the thing that stands out in your mind and it's a bit for the movie and it's terrific almost every almost every movie that i'm mentioning here has a great bit in it of one kind or another uh and that brings us to number one uh and number one is the greatest science fiction movie not adapted from uh, source material. It's also, as I mentioned in my previous video on the subject, the greatest movie of all time. We're talking 2002. The directors are Chris Sanders and Dean Dubois. And the movie is Lilo and Stitch from Disney. Which is the story about a mad scientist <laughs> who's, uh, who's voiced by uh, one of my favorite actors. Uh, a, a mad scientist who creates a synthetic being that is pure violence and that is creepy and weird uh this is in its baby form uh he has a name for the experiment but the experiment gets away it escapes from the galactic federation that has utterly forbidden such experiments it gets away and it crash lands on earth the experiment itself has a molecular density that's too great to allow it to cra to traverse water so it's terrified of water the being just happens to land on Hawaii. <laughs> it lands on an island. So it's surrounded on all sides by water. It's contained. But it, the little experiment doesn't know what it is. And no one on Hawaii knows what it is. And the aliens haven't come to get it yet. And a little girl who just can't catch a break. She is, she, little Lilo just can't catch a break. She decides to buy this little creature. Thinks it might be a dog. <laughs> she buys it uh, and calls it Stitch. And the movie is incredible. Just amazing. It's full throttle, foot on the pedal Disney treacle, but it works. It absolutely works. It doesn't often Disney treacle doesn't often always work, but this works from beginning to end, just from beginning to end. And maybe I don't, it sounds like heresy, <laughs> considering what a huge fan I am of Little Mermaid and Pocahontas and Beauty and the Beast. It sounds like heresy to say this, but maybe. Maybe Lilo and Stitch also benefits from the fact that it isn't crammed full of musical numbers. Could be. 
the movie has one one standout musical number. It's absolutely beautiful. Painted stills. Uh, it's called Hawaiian Roller Coaster Ride, and it, it's about surfing, and it's but it, it, it like the best Disney musical numbers going back 70 years. It isn't just a song. It also manages to advance the characters. So you know all the characters better by the time the song is over. And th that's pretty much the only thing. There's a bit of a musical number at the beginning, a little bit. There's, of course, Elvis at the end. But but that's pretty much it for the music. I almost said musical intrusions. <laughs> and I don't think that. That's the point. I don't want to I don't want to give the impression that I think that. Because I love Disney music in their cartoons. I love it. Absolutely love it. <laughs> I use antlers in all of my decorating. <laughs> I wouldn't do without a lot of the songs that Disney does. But uh, I don't know. Lilo and Stitch is such a strong story. It's such a, it's such a good story uh, that it, I, I didn't miss it. Uh, and I love it. And it's great. And it's fantastic. And it's infinitely rewatchable. And if somehow or other, maybe in the Disney glut, when you thought, oh, my God, there's so many of these things, maybe you have missed it. Gather together a few of the people you love most, and especially a few of the people you won't be embarrassed if they see you tear up. And watch it. <laughs> Just watch it. And you'll see what I mean. I'm sure that you'll agree with me. Now, in his list, Grammaticus Books did not give a, uh, an honorable mentions of any kind. Maybe he had already exhausted all the movies that were made in the 1980s. <laughs> but I actually have a movie that's so close to the 1970s, 1979, that it pretty much counts. That I want to give as an honorable mention. For two reasons. One, because it's absolutely terrific. And two, uh, I couldn't... I couldn't let Grammaticus be the only one that mentions this director. We don't need to get into the reasons why. <laughs> this is this is Time After Time by Nicholas Meyer. A uh, terrific movie. If you again, if you missed it, you're you're going to love it. You're absolutely going to love it. Where uh we meet H.G. Wells, who has invented a time machine. The time machine that is the that is the focus of his novel. But he isn't the one to use it. The great David Warner uses it. And David Warner is H.G. Wells' fellow Victorian, but he's also something else as well. He's Jack the Ripper. <laughs> and he takes the thing forward in time. Wells thinks he has no alternative but to come forward and stop him. Come forward and do something about it. Uh, it I mean, it's his fault that this guy is let loose on the 20th century in the first place. And uh, it's a terrific movie. It's really well-paced, as any Nicholas Meyer movie will be. Uh, and... It also has a great moment. I'm not meaning to reduce any of my picks just to their moments. But there's a great moment in Time After Time. I, if you know the movie, you'll know exactly the moment. I'm sure that we would all agree on the exact moment that we mean. The moment when David Warner's character turns on the TV for H.G. Wells, when they're both in the 20th century. If that doesn't stop you for a minute when you see it for the first time, I don't know what would. <laughs> but anyway, those are my top ten science fiction movies not adapted from comics or movies or anime, your precious anime, or anything like that. <laughs> and as you can see, thanks to the fact that Grammaticus and I are butting heads dude bro style, you actually get 20 movies. We didn't overlap at all. Oh, well, I have a couple of directors, maybe a couple of themes or ideas. I also enjoyed the 1980s. <laughs> but what will we do next? Huh? What will we do next? Top 10 movies? Not just science fiction, but all movies? Mm -hmm. Or top 15 science fiction novels? Ever? <laughs> Who knows what it will be? We will confer and then inflict the results on all of you. But in the meantime, there you go. Best science fiction movies. Done. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up. I'll, I'll try to remember to leave a link to Grammaticus. You definitely should go and subscribe to his channel and see what you think about his list. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.